I would like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our craft. If you're a returning viewer, it is so nice to see you again. And if you're a new viewer, I'm really glad that you found your way to my little corner of the internet. Today's episode will include finished objects, works in progress, an update on the frog and fix along, and I thought that I would talk a little bit about yarn weights and which ones are my favorite. I will be honest, I've been having a difficult time coming up with general topics lately. <laughs> I need to just sit down and brainstorm a list, but in the meantime, if there is anything that you would like me to cover, either a specific question you have or just a topic that you would like to hear my ramblings about, it would be so helpful for me if you could leave that in the comments, either here on YouTube, over on Ravelry, or on Instagram. I just... I feel like I need some outside inspiration lately. I don't know. I haven't. I think I feel like I've just been knitting as opposed to thinking about knitting as much. Okay, so, and rather than knitting today, I'm winding yarn. So if you hear a kind of shh in the background every once in a while, that's probably my swift. But I will put it down so that we can talk about finished objects. So first up, I knit myself a tam. I love colorwork berets, and this is the first time in a while I've knit one, and I had such a good time knitting this. So I'm calling it my Hocus Pocus Tam because I wanted it to feel very Halloween-y and a little bit witchy, and this is what it looks like on. And I used the Croft Hoose hat pattern, might be Croft Hoose beanie, by Ellie. Why don't I know her last name? But she's, uh, she works in Shetland, and she's been a Shetland Wool Week patron, and the Croft Hoose hat was one of the free patterns a couple of years ago. But I really loved it, and I've been wanting to knit it ever since. And when I decided that I wanted an orange and purple hat, I thought that this would work really well. I did do some changes to it to make it into a beanie, or sorry, into a beret instead of a beanie, and those will be listed on my project page. Essentially, I just knit it at a lot more stitches around. Then I realized that I had knit, uh, it was going to end up too big, so for the final round of houses, I decreased, so essentially this started the crown. And so for the, the crown as written, these are the pattern decreases, this beautiful spiderweb looking thing. Um, I've got six instead of eight, I think. So, um, and then I also added stripes in between. And that was because I really wanted the russet orange and the purples to be the focus of the hat versus the lighter background color. So I thought adding some stripes would just help emphasize that. In retrospect, I would have only done stripes around the lighter background panel. I wouldn't have done them here just because that's part of what made me realize that this hat was getting too long. And also, I knit to the pattern gauge, which was a larger gauge, I think around six inches to the inch, compared to the other color work um, cams that I've done. So I think that that's what threw me off. So next time I would probably do 180 stitches, not 192 for the body, and cut out those stripes, and then I would probably be able to have more of the hats visible. You know, when I wear it, only that first round of hats is visible. But that's okay. I am still really, really happy with how it turned out, and I've been wearing it a lot. Um, oh, and then I changed the corrugated rib to 2x2 two two ribbing instead of 1x1, one one, just because I'm not a big fan of corrugated rib, and with 2x2 two two, I don't have to switch the yarn as much. And I think I made it longer, too. Um, yeah. And I, did, I worked that on a much smaller amount of stitches than the body of the hat, just to make sure it would be a nice snug fit on my head. So, I'll show you the yarn that I used. Most of it is Knit Picks Palette, which is a 100% wool two-ply fingering. It's very affordable, and I'm pretty sure it's inspired by kind of Shetland yarn and just general color work, because it's a fairly loose two-ply. So, let's see, I've got four of those. The orange is Rebus Heather. It's that type of tea, but I have no idea how to pronounce it. Obviously, these will all be linked on my project page. And the lighter purple, which is the background here, is Iris Heather. The 
darkest purple is the only one that's not Knit Fix palette. That is Alice Starmore Hibridian Two Ply in Limpet. The medium purple, which I know it looks the same here, but that's just because it's a lighter background, is Clematis Heather. Clematis? Wow, apparently I don't know how to pronounce anything today. And finally, the background color is just Finley Heather, which I had also used with those dandelion lips that I knit. So, I had a good time swatching to make the colors work. I knew that I wanted it to be mainly purple and orange, and I really liked the way that these two looked together as balls of yarn, but it turned out they're just, they're, so originally I had planned to do this one as the roof here, but it didn't have enough contrast between the iris it looks like it should, but it didn't. So that's when I went and got my darker purple. And then I still at least got to put the Clematis and Rebus together in this section. Um, ideally, I would have had a slightly darker background color so that that background color isn't quite so bright in the hat. But, you know, you work with your stash, um, not, with <laughs> not with ideal all of the time. And, yeah, just in order to get the rubus and clematis together some more, that's what I did in these stripes as well. Since you don't need contrast when you're not doing, you know, if you're just doing stripes instead of color work. Um, yeah, I'm really, really happy with it. To me, it just, it says Halloween. And it's nice and warm. It doesn't feel the same way. So the other color work berets that I've made are either out of Shetland yarn or Alice Starmore Hibberty and Two Ply. And they feel they feel more like a solid fabric. Like this feels like a you know like a I don't, more of a knit fabric, kind of like a sweater kind of thing whereas the other tams they're not felted, but they have more of that cohesive feel. The yarn really sticks together in a different way. And I'm sure that those other hats are way more waterproof. I haven't worn this in the rain yet, but it doesn't seem like it would repel rain in the same way that the other hats do. Uh, so this yarn definitely creates a different final fabric, but also I knit it at a, a larger gauge than I had than I knit my other ones. But I don't know. There's something just really nice about the way that Shetland yarn creates hats that I really enjoy. But it's harder to get over here. It is quadruple the price. Yeah, I want to say it's about $6 for 25 grams, whereas the, um, the Knit Picks palette is like $3.50 for 50 grams. And I think that the colors of the Knit Picks palette are absolutely beautiful. I love the Heathers. I would love to have more of the Heathers in this yarn. And as I said, this yarn is less itchy for me and so I'm still wondering if I'll be able to knit a sweater out of it. I would love to have like a hocus pocus sweater. Um, I really love these little croft hoose pattern. I think it's really a fun touch and a really smartly designed hat. So it was free during the original Shetland Wool Week that it was released at and now it's a paid for pattern and she also has mitts and a sweater so you can put adorable little hats on everything. And yeah, it was it was interesting. I haven't done color work in a while, so I forgot just how much swatching you have to do because the way the yarn looks when it's next to each other in a ball does not really have that much <laughs> correlation between how it looks once you've knit it up. Luckily, I had remembered enough that I just knit a really tiny swatch, basically one hat's worth, and to try out the different color repeats and what would work and that kind of stuff. And yeah, I absolutely love color work knitting, but I do feel like from a financial perspective, it's one of the less accessible forms of knitting just because you end up needing so many different values in different colors. And so you need to have both the money and the space to store that kind of yarn. And then, you know, you don't use a lot of each ball. So as you knit more, you do end up with a bigger stash. But I feel like the initial entry level is higher than with a lot of other knitting. I'm almost wondering if I should knit some leg warmers to match. I've been wearing the leg warmers that I have quite a bit. I'm wearing my new striped pair today, and I think that uh, some croft hoose leg warmers would go really well with my boots and be a really fun way for me to have like a matchy-matchy autumnal accessory set. 
And I've got quite a few solid color dresses that I think would go with these colors. So that kind of popped into my head just now, and all of a sudden I'm really excited about it. <laughs> my next finished object I will have to insert photos of because I don't have them anymore. I knit two more gnomes, which is using the uh, Never Not Gnoming pattern from Sarah of Imagine Landscapes, except I, last time I did it accidentally, this time I did it on purpose, I do a Hobbit modification where I, I end up with shorter bodies, which I like because it takes a little less time and a little less yarn. So I had another friend's birthday come up and uh, suddenly I'm knitting birthday gnomes for everyone. <laughs> And then uh, Joel's birthday is back in April when mine was before I was knitting birthday gnomes, so he didn't get a gnome, so I felt that he needed a gnome. So I knit a very woodland, acorn-feeling gnome for my friend Christy because she loves the woods. And then I knit a green and orange gnome for Joel because those are his two favorite colors. And it was especially fun to knit it at this time of year because they're also pumpkin -y colors. I love autumn. I don't care that everyone else does as well, and I'm not at all original for enjoying all my pumpkins and things. I think we should all just celebrate together all the time. I don't, I don't need to feel special about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, I love the gnomes. Everyone I've given the gnomes to, they really enjoy them. I think they have a lot of personality. I like that they use scraps, but they do take a bit more time. Before them, I would knit those little wee woodland wuzzies. And those are knit out of worsted weight, so I could knit one of those and have it assembled and finished in less than an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Whereas with these gnomes, it takes almost two hours, really, from start to finish. Um, which, as I said, I think it's worth it. It's just something to keep in mind if you're looking for a little gift pattern to give to people. I have a lot more fingering weight scraps than worsted weight scraps to use up, though, so they are nice from that perspective. I, I really love them. It's just, I want some gnomes for myself, and I keep knitting them and then giving them away to people, so that's okay. I'll, I'll get some of my own eventually. And my final finished object is my Simplicity Cowl. So this is out of, hang on, let me find the scene, Points and Company Phoebe, which is their 100% extra fine American Merino. It's their only breed-specific yarn. And it's DK weight, and it's kettle dyed, and this is the mercury colorway, which I love. And I cannot find my seam. There it is. Yeah, so before I put it on, so all I did was I cast on 61 stitches, and then I knit and seed, sti knit and seed stitch until I ran out of yarn. I had 200 grams, and I used them all. And then I grafted it. And I looked up how to graft and seed stitch, and I did follow the directions, but I think I didn't notice because the formatting was weird on my phone and I couldn't be bothered to get up and look at my computer, that I should have like knit either one more or one fewer row on one of the sides. So it looks more like moss stitch than seed stitch, but I don't mind because it's a seam, right? I can just put it at the back of my neck. But I think it's really neat that you can graft in so many different patterns. I found an interweave article that was really helpful just from Googling it. And I absolutely love this. This shade of blue, the very muted, kind of dusty blue, is one of my favorite colors in the world. It's looking a little brighter on camera. Hopefully that's just the, the camera screen and not how it's going to look in the recording. But yeah. And it fits nice and loosely, kind of fashion style, if I wrap it twice. And if I really am out in a lot of wind and need it to be extra snug and windproof, then I can wrap it three times, which is, for me, ideal. <laughs> for a heavier cowl. I like that that way they can function as both indoor and outdoor stuff. And yeah, I really, really love how all the seed stitch looks, and I like how knitting it so wide just makes it into a really nice generous cowl and it was really fun to knit i had a really nice relaxing time it just felt like i was enjoying the yarn and i could use my wooden needles because i was using size six and it was just it's definitely more of a process than product to knit even though i'm really happy with the end results 
I think next I'm going to knit a fingering weight cowl since uh, so many of you were saying that you do like to wear them with hand knit sweaters and see how that goes. Although I'm wearing this with a hand knit sweater right now and it feels good. They haven't turned the heat on in my building yet and it was in the 40s this morning. Um, which is around, what, 5 Celsius? And so I am definitely in all the woolens today. I'm wearing my marzipan cardigan, which I will talk more about later. On to works in progress with a tea break. Okay, so I am still working on my hedgerow cardigan. It's going to look really weird. <laughs> so I've knit the back, both the fronts, one of which is now attached to the back, and the first sleeve. And, oh, I love how that turned out. I decided to add a little cabled elbow patch, and I used the same cable from the front of the sweater. Um, and I just, I love the diamonds that it made. So, as you can see, this is a kind of quirky construction method that I'm choosing. And here, there we go. First of all, this made it really clear to me why sleeves take up so much yarn. <laughs> sleeves flat always just look really weird. Oh, I've messed up all the color balance on my camera. Um, but So I knew that I wanted to knit the sleeve top down because I have five skeins of yarn and I wanted to get sleeves as long as I could. I know that I've been on a three-quarter sleeve knit knitting thing, but we've had some colder weather here now, and oh my gosh, when it's in the low 50s, I can wear just a sweater. I don't need to wear a jacket, but then if that sweater ends here, this part of me gets cold, and I know that I can just knit some more mitts, um, but still, I don't know. I'm wearing my nice snuggly long sleeve that I knit extra long on purpose cardigan today, and it's feeling like the right decision. <laughs> I guess that's one of those things where, you know, in the spring, I want shorter sleeves, and then in autumn, I just want everything snugly. So that's why I decided that if I could go for full length sleeves, I wanted to. And I also knew that I wanted to put the elbow patches in, and it seems like it would be easier to place that if I did a top down sleeve. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, in that case, I might as well do a short row sleeve cap like the Audrey and Oost pattern by Gudrun Johnston has. So those are the directions I used. But rather than seam up the sides of the body, I decided to just leave them open, and I only seamed at the shoulder because that was the only part that I needed in order to, do, to pick up for the sleeve. And that's because I don't find it nearly as comfortable to knit sleeves that are attached to the body of a sweater as I do to knit them separately. Uh, which is why usually I'll just do bottom-up sleeves. But I was thinking about it, and one of the things that I find frustrating about knitting sleeves that are attached to bodies is that um, you have to just move the body around so much. So I was like, well, maybe if I haven't done up that side seam yet, it won't feel as bulky, and at least for the first sleeve, I'll only have to attach one front. And it really did help. The other thing was I knit the sleeve flat instead of in the round, and that way I didn't have to keep twisting the whole sweater. Instead, you know, I would knit the sleeve one side and the other side, and it was so much more comfortable. I could definitely see myself knitting sleeves that way in the future, whereas usually if I'm knitting sleeves attached to a body, then I get really cranky really quickly, and I'm like, ugh, oh, I'm never going to do this again. So I think I might have found my preferred attached sleeve knitting method, of course, I haven't seamed up the sleeve yet, but I enjoy seaming, and I also don't mind purling, and I don't mind, you know, so I don't mind knitting flat, and I think it's actually easier to work a lot of cables flat than it is this cape. Twisted stitch cables are different because you're working every round, but this cable, you're only working the right side, so that makes it really easy to know when you need to be doing things. And yeah, um, I just adjusted the... Audrey and Oons directions a little bit because my gauge was a little bit different. I think just my gauge. Maybe my gauge was about the same. I think I'm knitting it like six and a half or seven stitches to the inch, and that pattern calls for six or six and a half stitches to the inch. So it wasn't really a big change. 
I picked up two extra stitches on each side. And yeah. Um, so what I did was I've got two full, I had two full skeins left over, so I wound up one of them, and then I just knit until the end of it, but I haven't bound off yet. I threw it on waste yarn because I've also got 24 grams of yarn in all my swatches. So I'm going to knit the other sleeve the same, then undo the swatches, do the neck band and button bands, and then whatever's left, I'll just make the sleeves longer with that. I forgot to say the other reason why I wanted to knit this sleeve flat is that I'm going to add embroidery to the cables and it's so much easier to embroider flat fabric than it is to try to get your hand up around sleeve and do the embroidery that way as someone who has embroidered leg warmers and mittens. <laughs> so that was my thinking process there. So I have wound up the final skein for the second sleeve. I'm going to go ahead and work on that this weekend. And then I think I'm going to block everything before I seam it up because that way it'll be nice and flat for the embroidery and I just want to see if my gauge has changed at all or anything. Um, but yeah, so I'm one sleeve and a bunch of finishing away from a new sweater, which is really exciting. And I'm really pleased to have maybe come up with another sleeve method that I enjoy doing because it's, it's nice to have some variety. The other work in progress is new. I'm knitting a pair of socks for my mom. I don't think I've named them yet because I haven't started their Ravelry page. Um, this is Knit Picks Felici in Stone Harbor, and then this is Knit Picks Comfy Fingering, the contrast toe in Sea Breeze, I believe. Um, my mom has only found two wools that she can wear, Knit Picks Felici and then Quince and Company Chickadee, which she wears as hats and mittens. Everything else she needs to have plant-based fibers, even not even most superwash. So that's why the Comfy Fingering, which is a cotton acrylic blend, is what I'm using for the heels, toes, and cuffs. And she already has two pairs of Felici socks, and she really loves them. So um, I've had that yarn in my stash for over a year, waiting to be knit. The reason why I haven't cast on before is because I only have one gram of the Felici, so I want to maximize the yarn usage, which means I need to be knitting toe-up socks, and I don't like knitting toe-up socks. And the reason I don't like it is because of the toe. I find it really fiddly, and it's not something that I do that frequently, so I don't remember how to do it, and I have to look it up each time. And so I started a Turkish cast on, and the toe that I did for her last pair of socks first, and it just went terribly wrong. So then I remembered the short row toe that I did for my very first two pairs of socks, which I knit toe up using Wendy Johnson's Toe Up Socks book. And I really enjoyed knitting short rows, and you start with a provisional cast on, and I really enjoy the Tech Knitters provisional cast on. It's really quick and simple. So I thought, you know, I should just do that. And then you knit the toe flat, so you're only using two needles, until you get to the body of the sock, and that just seemed like it would be far less fiddly for me, my knitting style. So I did that, and it worked wonderfully, and so the same way that I think that I have found a attached sleeve style knitting that works for me, I think I've also finally found a combination of toes and heels for toe-up socks that makes me much more interested in knitting more toe-up socks in the future. And for my mom's socks, I'll be using a Fish Lips Kiss heel that I've modified to make a bit deeper. And that is because short row heels don't affect stitch count. So if you're knitting with a self-striping yarn, that means the stripes will be the same. And that's important to me. Otherwise, when I'm just knitting plain toe-up socks, I like doing a gusset heel. But the heel flap ends up on the bottom of the foot, so you don't have to guess where to increase. I'll try to find the link to that. Um, or the next time I knit a pair of toe up socks, I'll show you. But yeah. And I'm doing the Hermione's Everyday Sock Pattern, that texture. That's basically. Uh, just because I really like the fabric that that makes. I have a pair of those socks, and I just, they feel like such hugs to wear. So I thought my mom would like that too. And I'm just waiting because I did actually take notes on the last pair of socks I knit her but I didn't quite take notes on how many stripes to do between the toe and the heel. So I asked her to please send me a photo. 
of the last pair of socks that I knit her because she really likes how those fit. And then I'll know whether I need to put the heel in, like where to put it in. So I went ahead and knit one repeat of each stripe, and now I'm just waiting. My mom has very small feet. She wears a size five and a half shoe, and she likes snug socks. So you don't end up knitting very long on the foot. Let's see, anything else to say about that? Oh, I also, the other reason why I've been putting off knitting this sock is that for both my mom and my aunt, I work the sole stitches on size double zeros and then, no, the sole, I don't know, the bottom of the sock on the foot. I work on double zeros and then the top of the sock is on regular zeros and that creates a, fa a firmer fabric that they both really like. But for that to happen, that means that instead of using five double pointed needles, I've got six, right? So I've got a spare wooden one to knit across these two and then a spare metal one, which are the double zeros to knit across here. So that's a bit more fiddly. And then my double zero needles are Haya Haya and they're steel. And I understand why, because that's quite thin, but they're not really that comfortable for me to hold. Even though I hold them loosely, they still end up hurting my hands. So. Those are all the things that make the knitting socks for my mom a little fiddlier than knitting socks for other people, and is why she has had to wait. She got her Mother's Day socks this year, but um, I do feel bad that it's taken me this long to cast on for that Felici yarn. But yeah, The good thing is she absolutely loves her socks. She wears them a lot, so the slight fiddliness, and she's got short feet, so I only have to knit with the double zeros for a short amount of time. Um, and it's completely worth it to give them to her. So I know it sounds like I'm complaining, but really I'm just talking about I don't know, all the little quirky details that go into those socks versus other socks that I knit. So my work for the frog or fix along that I've been unofficially doing since August now was actually my marzipan sweater. And Back in August, I showed it to you and I said, oh, I need to do some reinforcement crochet chain along the neckline because it's stretched out. But as soon as the weather cooled off, I started wearing this and I realized that it wasn't just the neckband, which was terribly stretched out and made the sweater like fall off my shoulders, which drove me nuts. But also the button bands had gotten really stretched out as well. And so they did that wavy thing and they were just too long. And so... I was wearing the sweater, but it really only looked good if I had the top button buttoned and everything else open, which makes it a lot less versatile in my wardrobe because I like to wear my cardigans with just the two waistbands buttons buttoned over dresses. And that's, especially at this time of year, that's my preferred outfit combination. So um, I realized that I was going to have to cut off no, I was going to have to remove the button bands and the neck band and just re-knit them from scratch because I was too zealous in my blocking. This was the first wool lace sweater that I made versus the linen ones that I've made. And I wasn't really sure how to block it. And so I didn't pin it, but I did pat it out to dry. And I must have just stretched out the ribbing too much. And so... It fits so well before I blocked it, and really after that initial block is when I messed up the neck band and button bands. So ever since last winter when I finished it, I was both really proud of how I had adapted the sock pattern to be a sweater, but also really horrified at what was happening in this front area. And so I'm really glad that I finally fixed it, basically, if that's my point. But it did take five hours, a little less than five hours. I'm sorry, I'm just going to turn my heating pad back on. It's got an auto timer. I know this because I happened to start a new audiobook <laughs> when I sat down to do it. Oh, I had finished winding my stand again. And so I could just look at where the audiobook was at the end. I suppose I did take a dinner break, but not a very long one. And so when I knit this sweater, I used one by one ribbing and I used a tubular cast on on the bottom edges and then a tubular bind off at the top edges, which means that I grafted all the stitches together around the neck band and the button bands, which would have 
So that's a sewn bind off. So if you want to take that out without cutting the yarn, you would have to basically unsew it, right, one at a time. I was not going to do that. So I took my scissors and I cut off just the bind off, not the whole thing on the button bands. And then I tried to keep it close to the bind off and then I just kind of found the yarn where it was solid and unraveled the rest of the button band. So I had a couple little balls and that sounds simple, but it took some fiddling because I had all those little bits of yarn sticking out and so, oh, and of course I had to cut the buttons off before I did anything else and there were nine buttons. So then I got to the neckband and I started trying to do the same thing and the yarn was just being even less cooperative and I realized that I had both my swatches left over. If I really needed to, I had a whole other skein of this yarn that I could have wound up. So I just went ahead and cut the neckband right next to, you know, where the stitches had been picked up originally and then picked all that yarn out so that I could just start from scratch. And so that took about two hours, I think, yeah, to get everything back to the original state. Then, of course, I had to, first I picked up for the neckband, and I still knit it in one by one twisted rib, but this time I just did a normal bind off, just in case I ever have to adjust it again. And I like how the chains look. And then I did the same with the button bands. I made them much shorter and snugger. And that took another two hours. I think two, I mean, it's a fairly fine gauge. So both the button bands had 93 stitches in them. And that's 12 rows. So that's like 2,000 stitches right there. Plus the neck band, which is always longer, even though I did fewer rows. Anyway, so it was a lot of knitting. And the yarn was quite fine. I didn't bother washing it to straighten it first. I decided it would just, it would do what it was going to do. And then it took about 45 minutes to re-sew on all the buttons and weave in the new ends. So that was a process, but I had an evening to myself. I didn't have any other plans. So I just started what turned out to be a really excellent audiobook. And um, it's what my sister recommended. It's The Court of Thorns and Roses. And I'm about six hours into it now. And it's the first in a series of nine, which, wow. But uh, my sister gave me her Audible account information, so she has all of them, so I don't have to worry about doing holds at the library. But <coughs> so far, it sort of feels like a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but with fairies and also with a heroine who has different skills, perhaps, than traditional Beauty and the Beast skills. And I, I'm really enjoying it. It started out, I'm like, okay, this is good. And then around hour five, it completely grabbed me. But, yeah, so, you know, I didn't have any other plans for the evening. And at first I was kind of like, oh, I can't believe I spent all this time. But as soon as I put the sweater on and it fit the way I wanted it to fit, and I realized that I would be able to wear it all the time, because I kept reaching for this, because it's a color that goes with so many clothes. And it goes really well with my Hocus Pocus hat. Um, and so the, those extra five hours of work were completely worth it because I know that I'm going to be wearing this all of the time and now I won't feel awkward or embarrassed by how it fits. There is, I know it looks like there's a little bit of puckering, but when I button that top button, that smooths out. So I don't think I picked up too few stitches. I think that it's just because I haven't blocked it since putting these new bands on. I'm going to block it very gently and carefully and in a way that does not ruin the ribbing this time. But yeah, so that's what I did for my whole sweater drawer reevaluation <laughs> in these past couple weeks. And I'm really, really happy because five hours sounds like a lot of time, but compared to how much time it takes to knit a sweater, you know, to suddenly have a much more wearable sweater in my wardrobe, it makes a big difference. So next up is going to be the swan yoke. I pulled both of them out, but I decided to start with this one because the swan yoke sweater is wearable in its current state, and this one was not. Okay, so let's see. guess I will 
talk a little bit about yarn weights next. Getting towards the end, I didn't realize how much I would have to say about each of my projects today, or I would not have planned to do a general topic as well, but that's okay. So, for me, fingering weight is probably my favorite weight of yarn. It's my favorite one for sweaters, of course you knit socks out of fingering weight yarn, and then color work berets and mitts and that kind of thing also tend to be knit out of fingering weight yarn and so I find that the vast majority of projects that I want to make all use fingering weight. <laughs> Which on the one hand that's great right to have a favorite weight of yarn but on the other hand I like to give my hands a break so what I try to do is have a project projects that use different weights of yarn. And so that means that anytime I cast on fingering weight socks or a fingering weight hat, my fingering weight sweaters end up taking longer because then I've still got a heavier project, like in this case the cowl out of DK weight that I'm working on at the same time. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword in that sense. And I think that I would knit more color work tams and that kind of thing if I wasn't also knitting sweaters. And for sweaters, I really, my, I don't want to go any heavier than a sport weight, and I'm not sure that alternating between a sport weight and a fingering weight gives you the same um, rest on your hands. I don't know if rest is the right word, but your hands move in different ways, so you can, I, I can knit more, not you, I can knit more <laughs> if I alternate in that way. So I'm also thinking about... I have knit one lace weight sweater and I love it. I wear it so much. It took me so long to knit, which is why I haven't cast on for another one. But I was thinking if I did cast on for one, then I would always have a lighter thing to alternate with. And there's no rush on that kind of sweater. I expect it to take a while. But yeah. So for me, it's always the dilemma of, okay, what heavier weight project am I going to be knitting? So I, I like mittens that are worsted weight because they keep me warmer. And I found that I like worsted weight leg warmers. <laughs> And a lot of my hats are worsted weight, just not the color work ones. Um, and then I've been working on that blanket, which is Aran weight. So I really love that, having a reliable, heavier weight project, because otherwise it just feels like 90% of what I want to knit is knit out of fingering weight. So that's my favorite weight of yarn. I really love knitting with it. It feels really good, and I really love wearing it. I like how the sweaters end up breathable and drapey and I don't know. Worsted weight sweaters are just too heavy for me. Um, wow, that was a really short discussion. <laughs> this is why I need your suggestions because I don't know lately I feel like I've got several new hobbies and new interests and so even though I still love knitting and I still love talking to you about my projects I don't have as much brain space to think about knitting philosophy stuff during the week so that's probably why it's been difficult for me to come up with topics so. but I'm still happy to talk about them I just haven't figured it out so do you have a favorite yarn weight to use either because you like the finished objects knit out of that or because you like how it feels I love how worsted weight yarn feels to knit with too every time I cast on for a worsted weight project I'm like oh this is so lovely because the yarn you know tends to be a bit heavier and you can feel it and then I've got my wonderful wooden needles which I adore and don't get to knit with enough because they only go to size four in the circulars and yeah so as far as from just a process perspective I love anything between lace and worsted and Aaron lace to Aaron but I, but from a product perspective, I'm very much in the fingering weight camp. So, curious about what you guys would do. And if I could only knit with one weight of yarn for the rest of my life, I would definitely choose fingering. And not just because you could hold it double and get a worsted weight, even without that. So finally, I thought that I would just talk a little bit about my future knitting, because I've been winding yarn for it as I was talking to you. So I'm going, I'm planning my next sweater, and that's because I want to block the green one before I've assembled it, and so I wanted to make sure that I had another one to knit, <laughs> in case I somehow magically finish the sleeve this weekend. I always overestimate 
how much knitting I'm going to get done. So because I spend the weekends at Joel's, so I have to pack on Fridays and I have to decide how much I'm going to do. So that's how I'm overestimating. But yeah, so I'm going to knit myself a gray cardigan, which I have been wanting a gray cardigan, especially last winter. I kept like reaching for one because it would have gone with so many outfits, but I had not knit it yet. So this is out of Quince and Company Turn, which is one of my very favorite sweater yarns. And it's the Basil, oh my gosh, colorway. I don't know how to pronounce anything today. It's the rock. And I have five full skeins of it and then 18 grams left over from a different project that I did. Um, so that's what I swatched with. And I'll probably undo the swatch and use it for the button bands and neck band and stuff and then use the, the 250 grams for the body of the sweater. So I did quite a bit of swatching with this last week, I think. I was in the mood for that kind of experimental swatching, so I had a much smaller swatch, and I tried out five or six stitch patterns, and I was thinking that I would do something from that Japanese stitch knitting dictionary, and I liked how it looked, but I didn't love it. So then I pulled out my Barbara Walker Stitch Knitting Treasuries, I think they're called, and I tried a few of those, and then I found this Candle Flame one and I loved it. It's exactly what I was looking for. It felt like it fit the yarn and it fit the feel and I think it really does look like candle flames and it also looks a little bit witchy. There's something about these kind of long tapered tops that remind me of witches hats, which this is the time of year for that. So I was really pleased that I had found, you know, the right one. So I unraveled that swatch and then I forgot I unraveled it so I spent like half an hour yesterday looking for it so that I could block it before realizing that I had unraveled it. So <laughs> then I cast on again and so this is basically my sweater swatch. So this is both a gauge swatch and originally I cast on this and then I experimented with how to increase because this pattern it's a 12 stitch repeat and of course it's got um, each candle flame or leaf, all those patterns, you know, they start with yarn overs. So that makes it really easy to increase in pattern. So I figured that I would be able to go ahead and do the waist to bust increases um, in pattern. So I experimented with that. So that's what these two are. <coughs> and then I also experimented with up around the neckline. I wasn't sure if I would want to have half finished you know, this repeat, or if I would just want a plain pearl background. So I tried out the plain pearl background so that I can decide on that. And then now that it's dry, I blocked this already, I am going to go ahead and pick up as if it's a button band, because you can see this pattern does a scallopy thing. And I don't want that on my button band. You know I really like a straight button band. <laughs> so I'm going to pick up for a button band and see whether those scallops stay or whether they start to behave themselves a little bit better. Um, I'm thinking otherwise I could add some plain knit stitches here which would decrease the effect a little and then maybe make a thicker button band. If you have any ideas for how to mitigate that, please let me know. And then it's interesting because this pattern has essentially pearl columns and so especially when you knit it, it almost behaves like a ribbing. So I wasn't really sure what level of stretchiness I would want in the finished sweater. So that's why I made a fairly large swatch so that I can kind of put it on and see how it's behaving. And already once it's locked, I didn't pin it out after ruining the bands on this sweater. Um, I don't want to have to pin out the sweater ever again, even though I didn't pin this out. But, you know, I didn't block it aggressively. That's what I should say. I just padded it out the way that I do any other sweater. <laughs> and I really like the way that it's behaving after blocking. It's still a bit bouncy, and you still definitely get how those the motifs are kind of rising up compared to the pearl, the reverse stockinette, I should say, background. So I like that you still get that kind of embossed 3D effect, but it's not as smooshed together as it was before blocking. So I'm really, really pleased with how this turned out. And so I definitely think that I'm going to do this for my next sweater. I'm going to do the body all over in it, both the fronts and the backs, and then I'll probably do plain sleeves.
maybe with a single one running up. I haven't decided. I tend to knit the body first anyway, so I don't need to decide that. Yeah. So that is my future cast on, and I've now got two skeins wound, thanks to I had already done one and then one while recording, so in case I magically finish that green sweater sleeve over the weekend, then I can go ahead and start knitting on this one. I love this time of year when every time you finish a knit, you can wear it immediately. It's so gratifying. I almost forgot my next board game review, which will be on the same YouTube channel, is going to be of King Domino, which is a really fun um, wonderful game that I think would also make a great introduction to board games. So if you're curious, that will be up on the channel as well. And um, I'm going to be doing a knitability scale just at the end of this when I'm talking about it. And this one, if you're playing with three or four players, you'll probably be able to knit. If you're playing as a two-player game, you probably won't have knitting time because you are picking up tiles and then laying them down. So depends on how many players you have as far as whether you can knit while playing or not, but I think that that's such a fun idea, so I'll definitely be talking about that for future games. thought it might be simpler for me to just record from the couch instead of get the pets over for me, so goodbye from this soul, <laughs> yeah, Ma, and myself, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much for watching. As always, in between episodes, you can follow along with me on Instagram or Ravelry. I am the charm of it in both places. And I really love receiving comments and messages and um, just getting to know you as well, since you know me a little bit <laughs> through all these episodes. So, until next time, goodbye!